we'll look into the next part which is about torsion drive system so if you're talking about the torsion drive system what exactly this entire system is made of and in this specific case we are looking at the torsion drive system as installed in the flap system so we'll try to look into that so this torsion drive system as i mentioned is included in the flap system and flap if i need to move the flap I can move the flap either by hydraulic means and if the hydraulic fails as part of the phaser feature I can allow the flap to move by electrical means as well. Now whether we are operating the flap by using hydraulic means or by using the electrical means the speed would be very high and you are required to reduce the speed and if you are required to reduce the speed that means it must also include the gear train so we will be having the gear train as well and it must also include the actuator now if we are using the actuator and the movement of the actuator is linear movement and the movement of the flap is angular isn't it so we require some provision to convert this linear motion into the angular motion so that the flap can have angular travel and that is being done by the use of the torque tube so the torsion drive system must also include the torque tube once we move the flap we must also know that the flap has traveled to a certain degree and the pilot must know about that as well and if the flap has traveled to a certain degree it must rest at that position as well torsion drive system must include the provision of locking it must also include the provision of notifying the pilot that the flap indeed traveled the selected position whatever the pilot selected so this provision of transmitting the position and letting the pilot know regarding the exact angular travel of the flap is also part of the torsion type system what else could be the part of the torsion type system it must also include because we are referring to flap so it must also include the so this system must also have flap screw mechanics so that means if you are referring to the torsion drive system we need to study the individual component which are part of the torsion drive system and this entire flap is moving over the flap track so it must also include the flap track now the ro it is the roller which is connected to the flap and this roller moves over the flap track so that means it must also include the roller or the flap trolley so the flap trolley or the roller the flap track the differential gears or the gear train the actuator locking provision so all these are part of the torsion drive system okay as per whatever written in the book so you can see here it says it also include the hydraulic motor and we are using more than one for redundancy if two motor hydraulic motor are used they are connected by the same gearbox to reduce the speed to change the direction now how the operation will be controlled if i need to operate the torsion drive system as we are referring this in terms of the flap so i need the flap selector lever so once i am operating the flap selector lever so that is the first thing i am going to do operate the flap selector lever 
So operation is gained controlled by the selector handle in the flight deck. Now this drive is transmitted from the motor or the gearbox to each of the flight system by a system of power tube running along the threading edge. So whatever I have discussed before. Regarding the joints, we have got individual components, shaft and each of these components. Now they are joint. Now whether the joint would be rigid joint or whether the joint would be a flexible one. If I got a flexible joint, then probably it is much better because the flap can have some misalignment. And if there is some misalignment in the flap, that needs to be taken care of. And how this can be taken care of if the joint is a flexible and not a very rigid joint? Because the flap can have misalignment in any of the degree of movement. It could have misalignment either in this direction or in this direction. So whatever the situation might be. So depending, because it can have misalignment in this or as well as this. So if I have the joint which can take care of this misalignment or this misalignment, so that means the joint need to be a universal joint. So the attachment would be universal joint. And not just the universal joint, even the attachment would also include the sleeve which is serrated. Serrations are provided, serrations in some rough edges. And these are done to take care of this misalignment. Now what about the gears? Because we are having these gear trains, we are having the gear boxes. Now quite natural, we don't want the engagement and the disengagement of the gear to be very rapid. We want very smooth movement. And if you want very smooth movement without too much of noise, so the best option would be if we use the bevel gear. So we will be using the bevel gear in the gear tree. We will also have intermediate gearbox. What for we would require the intermediate gearbox? Because the outboard flap travel and the inboard flap travel would be different. The outboard one need less degree of movement compared to the inboard one. So for this variation, we require a different gear mechanism so that the outboard flap moves by a lesser degree compared to the inboard flap. So we'll have the intermediate gear box. also have the provision of isolating the outboard flap system from the inboard flap system so that means the isolation valve must also be the part of the torsion drive system in certain type of aircraft in lieu of the screw jack mechanism we can also have chain and sprocket mechanism to transfer the drive. So, so we'll have hydraulic system A or hydraulic system B both operating together along with the electrical system. If one of them fails, in that case the rate of flap deployment would be half. If with the both the systems working together, if it is moving like this, with one system only working and the other fails, the rate at which the flap deployed will be half. Initially like this, now half. Rate at which the flap is deployed is getting reduced to half. Next is the drive unit. So if you are referring to the drive units, so what would be the part of the drive unit? So anything which is driving. So what are the things? that are driving the flap in this case it is the gear train quite naturally it is the actuator quite naturally what else? the flap jack that, that is also part of the drive unit 
the trolleys which is supporting the flap and allowing the flap to move along the flap track even that also is part of the drive unit so each of these are part of the drive unit so the drive unit comprises a gearbox a selector drum assembly powered by two hydraulic motor for guidance it rotates a top shaft system the top shaft will have this drive unit mounted. It is powered by two hydraulic motor or the log valve assembly. One supplied from hydraulic system A and another from system B. So for redundancy. The motor drive a main shaft through a differential gear and the spark wheel reducing gear. So we are using the differential gear and the so the gear mechanism are mainly used for reducing the speed and change in duration. A gear driven selector drum operates micro switch to arrest the flap when they reach the selected position. So when the selected position is reached, it, the flap movement needs to be stopped. For the flap movement to stop, it must stop only when the flow of the fluid is stopped. When the flow of the fluid would be stopped, if the flat motor is stopped. So if I got a switch which can stop the flat motor, in that case the movement will be stopped as well. So we have got this micro switch which will operate this uh, flap motor and stop the movement of the flap motor and thereby resting or arresting the flap into the desired position whatever position we are selected. So this is one of the way of arresting the position or locking the position of the flap by using the micro switch which is being operated by the selector drum. feature regarding locking as well and that additional locking is provided by this uh, mechanical end stop now let's say the flap you are moving by 20 degree and if it reaches the extreme end of its travel if it reaches the extreme end of its travel in that case it will create stress we don't want the flap to move to the extreme end of its travel. Okay? So if I can stop the flap to go 
to the extreme end of its travel and prevent this uh, flap from bottoming out. We need to have additional locking provision as a feature feature. So this additional locking mechanism is at this end. So for safety a mechanical end stop ensure that the flap trolley stops at the end of the screw thread. So the screw thread they are referring to is the flap jack screw. Next, the hydraulic system. For redundancy, we'll have more than one hydraulic supply. So you'll have two independent hydraulic systems which are identical. So hydraulic pressure is supplied to the flap selector lever via the flow control valve and isolating valve. We require the flow control valve to control the rate of movement of the flap. We don't want the flap to move abruptly. We want the flap to move smoothly and that is why we need to have the flow control valve that will control the flow of the hydraulic fluid to the actuator. And then we must have the isolating valve as well to isolate outward flap from the inward flap. So whenever we select the hydraulic pressure so the hydraulic fluid will be passed via the flow control valve and the isolating valve. Movement of the flap selector lever that means a flap lever move, whenever you are moving this flap selector lever it energizes the appropriate solenoid selector valve. So we are Operating the selector lever, by operating the selector lever, we are energizing specific selector valve. And that specific selector valve is operated by solenoid. It is a solenoid operating valve. And this would allow the pressurized fluid to pass through the hydraulic motor through the plug valve. And then the fluid would return from the hydraulic motor to the lock block and flap selector back to the main system. So pressure line and the terminal. So whenever it is moving to the pressure line, so it is moving through the lock block. So whenever it needs to return. So again, the return will be through the log valve as well. So that's what it is mentioned. So return fluid from the hydraulic motor passes through the log valve and the flap selector valve back to the main system. So whenever we are allowing the pressurized fluid, it is moving through the flap selector valve, through the log valve to the system and returning again following the same route. So the flow control valve controls the rate at which the flap moves and then we have got the throttle valve which slows down the rate at which the flap is moving towards the end. So we need the movement to be smooth, the transition to be smooth. So it is moving like this and then whenever it is approaching towards the end the movement must be slow and that is being done by the throttle valve. So in when the flap reaches the selected position, the selector valve solenoid is de energized because we don't want the flap to move any further. So we need to de energize the selector valve. So the solenoid selector valve gets de energized once the flap reaches the desired position. And that is done. The de energizing is done through the operation of the drum. Selector drum, micro switch. So, energizing and de energizing the selector valve, which is solenoid operated, is done by the use of the micro switch, which is operated by the selector drum. So, you need to remember this. 
So what is operating the selector lever? The solenoid operated selector lever, it is the micro switch. What is operating this micro switch? It is the drum selector which is operating this micro switch. Now the flap control, each fl separate flap operating hydraulic circuit is controlled by a separate 28 volt DC supply and each supply because again for redundancy we are using separate DC first flap. and each system again needs to be controlled individually by separate micro switches so as we have seen that the operation of the solenoid valve is depending on the actuation of the micro switch and what is operating the micro switch it is the selector drum and how the selector drum is operating the micro switch the selector drum has got cam in built into it so it is these cams which are operating this micro switch so cams on the outer periphery of the selector drum operate one switch at both the normal up down limit position overrun protection we don't want the flap to bottom out to end the extreme end of its travel so as a failsafe feature we won't only depend on the locking done by the selector drum apart from the locking done by the selector drum we must have additional provision as well and that additional provision is by means of the flap track so whenever the flap track or whenever the flap moves to a selected position and before it bottoms out before it reaches the end of the travel it makes physical contact with the micro switch built in into the structure and thereby stop the <coughs> movement of the flap beyond that limit and that's exactly what happens in order to prevent the flap from going beyond its end travel we don't want the flap to bottom out because that would damage the structure so in order to prevent that in order to prevent this overrun we won't only depend on the micro switch operated by the selector drum apart from that we are also depending on this uh, micro switch which is operated by the flap built-in micro switch which is part of the flap structure and once the flap reaches the position there is a structure called striker which strikes against this micro switch and stops the movement of the flap and lock the flap into that position. What about the asymmetric protection? We know that we need to have the asymmetric protection because if asymmetric protection is not there, in that case it will lead to rolling action. And then in a mechanical type, in the most simple form, we have seen that if I want to prevent asymmetric condition, I can physically connect both the flap together. In that case, the uh, asymmetric condition would be prevented. Another way could be if this individual flap, the flap in the left hand side and the flap in the right hand side, if they are generating some signals, electrical signals, and if both are moving by equivalent amount, in that case, the signal from the individual flap, left hand side and right hand side, would be in phase, and if not, they would be out of phase. So, depending on whether the signal is in phase or out of phase, we can know that the flaps are symmetric in operation or asymmetric in operation. And if we want to prevent asymmetric operation in that case, we will need to ensure that the electrical signals generated by the individual flap in the left hand side and right hand side are in phase. So, this system uses AC electrical supply is controlled by four synchros. So 
we are using the sink rules which are the small devices mounted on and driven by the screw shaft inboard and outboard of the flat system so you have got the flap, we have got the synchros attached here we have got the flap somewhere here we have got synchros here we have got synchros here so the flap moving by certain degree and thereby because the flap is physically connected via some conductor to the synchros the resistance of the synchros are changing now so they are here and as they rotate send an alternating signal to an asymmetry control box if the signal become out of phase with each other the overall travel of the asymmetry asymmetrically will be energized to lock out the system what about the position indicator if I need to indicate the position of the flap, so again we require transmission and receiving circuit. And this one will be working on the Whitston Bridge transmitter. If the selected position is reached, let's say 10 degree move. So at 10 degree movement, let's say the flap is moving by 10 degree and then this flap is connected physically again to a variable resistor. So whenever the 10 degree position is reached the, and it is making contact with this variable resistor, so it is generating a specific value of current and that specific value of current is lighting up some circuit. And maybe a bulb is there which glows when this 10 degree position is reached and whenever the 20 degree position is reached maybe you have got another bulb which light up when this 20 degree position is reached so basically it is depending on the change in the resistance the ratio of the resistance now regarding the maintenance of the flap system what type of maintenance action we carry out? So normally, if I need to do any maintenance on the flap, basically it is all about doing the lubrication. So doing lubrication is the main thing. So at all the hinge points, check for the lubrication. It must not be dry. <coughs> We generally don't use the normal lubricants in the flap system because the flap we need to operate during takeoff and landing time and because we are operating the flap during takeoff and landing that means it is near to the ground and because it is near to the ground so it can attract dirt and contaminants and normal lubricants will hold this and can damage the structure because it will you know, move over and uh, along the lubricants whenever you are operating the flap so with the grease and everything and with the contaminants settled there so this thing will bite against each other and ultimately can damage two main parts which are meeting against each other because with these contaminants getting trapped in between so we won't be using the normal lubricants we will be using light oil or sometimes we are using powder form of lubricants graphite, powdered graphite also used so anything which won't hold contaminants and if you are carrying out any maintenance work on the flap if we need to do some repair work on the flap because flap being part of the control system so we need to carry out rigging of the controls. So anytime you carry out any maintenance work on the flap, there is a possibility that the CG of the aircraft might have changed because of this. So it is better to check and go for the symmetry check, rigging, so those things are done. The leading edge flap. Here, we are referring to in this book 
they have specifically mentioned about 747-400 aircraft. This has got 28 leading edge flap. Out of this, 22 are the variable cambers and 6 are the Kruger flap. And all these are pneumatically operated flaps. So air is supplied to operate this flap. And the air is supplied to the power unit from ducts in the leading edge of the wing. So the leading edge of the wing will have the ducts through which the air will travel and then allow the flap to operate. So each drive unit assembly has two motors, one pneumatic and one electric. We have got this uh, motor, either pneumatic motor or electric motor, electrically powered or pneumatically powered motor. And the torque developed by this electrical or pneumatic powered motor is supplied to the rotary actuator, and then this rotary actuator finally moves the leading edge flat. So we'll have these different parts, rotary variable differential transducer which sends the movement and signal the flight control unit. So you can see our rotary variable differential transducer. Less. and then because this can be operated by electrical means and it can be operated by pneumatic means so you have got two different provision electrical operation and the pneumatic operation as you can see in the block and we have got this switches alternate mode electrical primary mode elect pneumatic or electric so we'll try to look into this leading edge flap pneumatic drive unit, how it functions and how it looks like. To know and see how it looks like and how it functions, we need to look into this diagram. So we need to understand this diagram properly. If you look into this diagram, you can see we have got some duct here. which in bracket it is written normally open and then we have got the shut, shut off valve where in bracket it is written normally closed then we have got something called REG and butterfly valve so that means regulator and butterfly valve so regulator will actually operate the butterfly valve how the butterfly valve got its, got its name because the way it operates, no flapping action. Then we have got this control valve which is controlling the rate of movement of the flap. And you can see here the control valve is mechanically connected to this differential at the top of the diagram. So you have got some differential and the control valve is mechanically connected to the differential and attached to this control valve are this motor, pneumatic motor in this case so this motor is operated by pneumatic source and you can see here the air is being used
we have got something called the primary position controller and the position and elect uh, so sorry the uh, alternate controller position indicator and alternate controller so we have got the primary controller at one end and we have got the alternate controller Now for the time being, remember that the primary controller is used for the numeric one and the alternate one is used for electrical. If you look into the controller, you can see some you know, nut-like structure. Can you see this, some nut-like structure? This one. Can you see this? So this nut-like structure can have a translational movement, linear movement. And that is why these are called translating nut. And you can see here some, something called stop region. So whenever this translating nut make physical contact with this stop, so this is actually acting like a stop. That means it is stopping the flap from moving further. Now, what is allowing this nut, translating nut, to move? You can see here this translating nut is attached to some shaft, isn't it? Correct? And this shaft is attached to this gear train. What is allowing the gear train to move? It is the air or the electrical supply or the electrical supply, isn't it? So the gear train is moving attached to this gear train via some shaft and is this particular shaft and this shaft is moving. This shaft is attached to this translating nut and this translating nut finally is making some physical contact with this stop and thereby arresting or stopping the movement of the flap. Okay. So, we'll try to look into the operation. So the pneumatic drive. Initially we'll try to look at the pneumatic drive. The flat lever is used to command the FCU operation. The flat control unit operation is controlled via the flap lever. You're operating the flap lever and that's how you are actuating the flap control unit. The flap control unit signal now is passed to the directional control motor and the shutoff valve. Now recall the direction control motor. So this is the direction control motor. What for I need the directional control motor because I want the flap either to move by this degree downward or upward. So if it is connected to some motor, the motor needs to be directionally controlled, right? So you have got the direction control motor. And the shutoff valve. Because finally the air is moving through some valve and it is because of this air which is applying pressure to this air motor so if I need to stop or start the movement of the flap in that case that is possible the movement can be made possible or the stop can be made possible only if I can allow the air to go or I can prevent or stop the air from going in. So what is stopping the air from going in or what is allowing the air to go inside, it is the shutoff valve. 
So if I am required to operate the flap, I need to operate the shutoff valve. So the shutoff valve is operated. So we are operating the shutoff valve and the directional control motor. The pneumatic pressure flows from the inlet duct through the alternate valve. So this, this is the alternate valve. So it is moving through the alternate valve which is normally open. And then finally it is applying pressure to this shutoff valve and then the shutoff valve is opening up. Okay. So this sh shutoff valve which is normally closed now is opened because of the air pressure. So it opens to pressurize the regulator and the air motor brake. So it pressurizes. If you look into this diagram again, so certain now after the air moves from the shutoff valve, the, this air is pressurizing this regulator and also this control valve. Also, from the regulator because it is operating pressure against the regulator so this regulator now is forcing the butterfly valve to open up with the butterfly valve getting open with the butterfly valve getting open so this air now acting against the control valve and with the shutoff valve open now air from the shutoff valve move through this line and it is moving into the brake actuator. Okay. Now this brake actuator, what is the requirement? We want the flap to rest and stay. Now once I want the flap to move. So what is making the flap to stay in one position? Probably we applied some braking action. So if I want the flap to move first, I need to undo this braking action. And that is why I need the air to act against this brake actuator so that the braking force can be undone so that I can let the flap Now we are in a position to move the flap. So the pneumatic pressure at the regulator opens the butterfly valve and regulates the pressure to the control valve. Pneumatic pressure at the air motor brake releases the brake, so the brake is getting released. The direction and the speed difference between the direction control motor and the output shaft follow up gear is sensed at the differential so if you look again at the diagram we have got the differential here so two different forces are acting at the differential we have got the force from the direction control motor and then we have got the force from this entire air motor and through this entire gear train follow up and acting against this differential so two different forces are acting against this differential So the differential uses the speed difference to position the control valve and maintain the PDU speed. So this will position this control valve. So the difference in the speed which is acting against the differential will act against this control valve and it will position the control valve. Because I want the flap to move at a specific rate. And to move the flap at a specific rate, I need to use the control valve. So the positioning of the control valve is essential. So how to position the control valve to control the amount of air which is going in? So that is being done by the use of differential speed 
which is acting against this differential which is mechanically connected to the control valve so the control valve position is changed the alternate controller position switch sorry and then we have got the position primary position controller and if you look at what it is written in your book this translate the amount of distance that the nut travels with the translating nut reaches its li travel limit it stops the direction of the control motor that in turn stops the PDU operation as I told you once it reaches the position it makes physical contact with the stop and thereby it stops the operation of the Electric drive. The signal to activate the electric drive motor closes the alternate shutoff valve. Sorry, alternate solenoid valve. The electric motor brake then releases the electric motor drive. The pneumatic brake holds the sun gear and the planetary, planetary gear at the air motor output shaft. The electric motor drives the output shaft through the ring gear. So we have got this electric motor. Now this would move this ring gear the elect the electric motor would move this ring gear and the sun gear okay <coughs> so the pneumatic brake holds the sun gear and planetary gear at the air motor output shaft so this is the pneumatic brake they are referring to so the pneumatic brake holds the sun gear of the planetary gear box so you have got the sun gear here so it holds the sun gear of this entire planetary gear system at the air motor output shaft this is the air motor output shaft it is holding in okay and the electric motor drives the output shaft through the ring gear of the planetary gear reduction and now this starts moving the ring gear When the translating nut in the alternate position controller reaches the end of the travel, now we are looking at this one. Now the electrical portion that means we are referring to the second one, the alternate. So this will give the pilot the position and as well as the limit. So if it is pneumatic, we will be looking into the first one primary position controller and if you are using the electrical in that case we will be using the alternate controller the operating time if it is pneumatic operation in that case we would require 9 seconds and if it is electrical in that case we would require 90 seconds so quite natural you can see with the electrical operation to operate the flap it requires more time compared to the pneumatic so the flap in specifically for 747 we are referring to they are attached to the inboard portion of the wing at the leading edge to increase the low speed flight lift there are three Kruger flap installed and the operation of the Kruger flap again by numeric means whatever numeric force we are generating we need to uh, transfer this force so definitely we would require some shaft so we have got the drive shaft so whatever it is moving so that is the drive unit okay the 
then we have got the offset gearbox if this is moving by certain degree and this is moving by certain degree so we need to take care of that so for that we have got this offset gearbox so we have got offset gearbox whenever you are operating the Kruger flap that time not an issue but then whenever we are taking it back retracting it in position to prevent any drag we need to have the fairing so we have got the fairing then we have got the rotary actuator then we have got something called the folding nose why folding nose because they're quite natural going up so sorry moving downward extending and retracting back so it is folding nose is folding this entire thing is in part of this flap panel. So that's it.